With Easter just around the corner, I wanted to make the traditional English Easter dessert, Simnel Cake. Now rarely have I come across a dish with a more varied, murky, and frankly fictitious past than this classic English cake, but that's going to make it all the more fun to talk about. So thank you to Trade Coffee for sponsoring this video as we dive into the mythical history of Simnel Cake. So what is Simnel Cake? I don't know. Well, it kind of depends on where you are. And when you are, but we'll get to that part later. See, the English towns of Devizes, Bury, and Shrewsbury all have competing forms of this classic dessert. But one thing that they typically have in common is that they were made on Mothering Sunday, or the fourth Sunday in Lent, and then eaten either then or on Easter, which is when it's typically eaten today. So in deciding on which version of the cake to make today, I had my options open. But I finally decided on a recipe by May Byron. Now, based on how it's written, the recipe is probably from the early or mid-19th century, but it was in a book that she compiled of recipes from the 17 and 1800s that was published in 1914. And while she says that the recipe is from Gloucestershire, it's definitely a Bury-style Simnel cake. Take a quarter of a pound of flour, three ounces of mixed peel, quarter of a pound of butter, three good-sized eggs, quarter of a pound of caster sugar, two ounces of ground almonds, three quarters of a pound of currants. Beat butter to a cream, add sugar and beaten eggs gradually, and work well together. Add flour, sifted. Beat thoroughly, then add remaining ingredients. Line a tin with greased paper, pour in the mixture, and bake in gentle oven from two to three hours. When cold, make some almond paste. Put a layer on top of the cake. Form remainder into round balls. Brush the cake over with white of egg and dust with caster sugar. Set in a cool oven till balls are lightly browned, and decorate with crystallized fruits. So for this recipe, what you'll need is one scant cup or 113 grams of flour. Now this would have been self-rising flour, which has a bit of salt in it, as well as baking powder. You'll notice that she didn't have any raising agents in the cake recipe, so that's how we know that that's what she was using. It was very popular at the time, and still is popular in England. But if you're in the US or much of the world, you might have trouble finding it. So what you'll need is one and a half teaspoons of baking powder and a half teaspoon of salt. Then one half cup or 85 grams of mixed peel, eight tablespoons or 113 grams of butter, three beaten eggs plus one egg white, a heaping half cup or 113 grams of caster sugar plus extra for dusting, a half cup or 57 grams of almond flour, and two cups or 340 grams of currants. The almond paste recipe that I'm using is from about the same time, and it just calls for 250 grams of caster sugar, 250 grams of almond flour, and two eggs. So it is a wonderfully cold and rainy day outside today here in Los Angeles, which is a rarity to say the least. But it is the perfect kind of day to bake a cake with a nice cup of coffee. All right, a quick cup of coffee. And lately, I've been getting my coffee from Trade. With Trade, you get to discover all new coffees from many of the nation's best local roasters. And the selection of coffee gets personalized to you, and then it gets shipped directly from the roastery so it is wonderfully fresh. All you do is take a little quiz about the flavors you like, how you take it, hot, cold, cream, sugar. I actually like both, and they do not judge. And then Trade curates a selection just for you. You get to decide how often you want it delivered, and then it's roasted and shipped within 24 hours of ordering, and boom, it's on your doorstep. Then you can rate the coffee so that Trade will learn what you like and what you don't like. I like chocolate, so lately they have been sending me Amsterdam Roast from Joe Coffee in New York City, and it has dark chocolate, walnut, and caramel flavors. It's delicious, especially with a little bit of cream, which is how I take it. And Trade guarantees that you'll love your first coffee, and if you don't, they'll ship you a different bag for free. And Trade is offering the first 100 viewers to sign up 50% off of their first bag, including free shipping. Just take the quiz by clicking the link in the description and enter the code TASTINGH50. Now before I go make a second cup of coffee, I should make my cake. So first set your oven to 300 degrees Fahrenheit or 170 Celsius. Then whisk the baking powder and salt into the flour and set aside. Then in a large bowl, beat the butter until smooth and fluffy and slowly add in the sugar and beat. Then add in the eggs and beat some more. It's a lot of beating, it's a very violent cake. Then sift in the flour and gently fold it in. And do the same with the almond flour. Finally, stir in the currants and the mixed peel. 
The fruit to cake batter ratio is, is crazy in this cake. It's a, it's a lot of fruit. Then line a round pan with parchment. I used an 8 inch cake tin. Then add the batter in and smooth the top. Now in most modern Simnel cake recipes, there's actually a layer of the almond paste inside of the cake. So you would put down half of the batter, then a, a layer like a disc of almond paste, and then the rest of the batter and bake it like that. Then there would be more almond paste on top. I'm not doing that because that's not what this recipe calls for, but if you want, just make a little extra almond paste and do, do what I just said. Then set the cake in the oven and bake for about two hours or until a skewer comes out clean. Now while the cake bakes, let's take a look at how the Simnel cake may have got its name. So as I said earlier, most of the history surrounding Simnel cake is dubious and should probably be relegated to the realm of folklore. And that's because the Victorians just loved making things up. But even so, we are going to go through the history because fact or fiction, it's really interesting. Now the first origin story is actually not that interesting, and it's probably the one that's actually true. The name came from the Latin term simila conspersa, which simply means fine white flour. And it probably referred to a bread rather than any kind of cake. In the Chronicle of Battle Abbey, William the Conqueror left to his monks a memorial of his love in appointing for their daily use bread fit for the table of a king, which is commonly called simonil. 36 ounces by weight and one fourth more during Lent that something might remain for charity. So yeah, white bread. Fit for a king, but white bread. Nice. Nice. Not thrilling, but nice. And it's also probably this bread definition that made its way into the Coverdale Bible of 1535. Thou didst eat nothing but simnils, honey, and oil. Not a very well balanced diet at all. The next story of how the cake may have got its name is definitely more interesting. See, if you brush up your Shakespeare, then you'll remember the villainous King Richard III. Now, one of Richard's most wicked deeds is the supposed murder of his two nephews, Edward and Richard. Yes, the nephew was also named Richard. You'll find that in this period of English history, everyone is named either Edward or Richard or Henry. And the women are all Elizabeth and Mary. Anyway, after King Richard was killed at the Battle of Bosworth Field and Henry Tudor had himself crowned King Henry VII, another claimant to the throne came out of the woodwork. It was a boy of ten, and he claimed to be one of those murdered boys from the tower. Then he changed his story to be a cousin instead, also named Edward, Earl of Warwick. But regardless of who he said he was, he was just being used as a pawn by some of the more wealthy nobles and a priest named Richard Simmons, not to be confused with that Richard Simmons. Well, the new King Henry VII said, <laughs> no, I don't think so. And in fact, this kid isn't even of royal blood. His name is actually Lambert Simnel, and he's the son of a baker. So there was a little rebellion, a little battling, and things did not go well for Lil Lambert. His priest friend got thrown in jail for the rest of his life, and most of the other adults pulling the strings got their heads chopped off. But we Simnel, on account that he was only 10 years old, was sent to work in the kitchens at the castle. And supposedly, while he was there, he invented a cake. And they named it after him. Simnel cake. Right. Seems very believable. Yeah, this is definitely one of the stories that the Victorians just made up. Now the last story of where it got its name is also a Victorian tale, but I feel like they never tried to pass this one off as actual history. It's more like one of those just so stories, like how the elephant got its trunk and it was a crocodile that pulled on it. This is how the Simnel cake got its name, and it is about as believable, but also just as entertaining. It comes from the 1867 edition of the Chambers Book of Days. See, there was a husband and wife duo, Simon, who they call Sim, and Nellie, who they call Nell. And at the end of Lent, they come across a bit of unleavened dough that needed using up. So Nell suggests that they make a cake, and Simon agreed. But when the cake was made, a subject of violent discord arose, Sim insisting that it should be boiled, while Nell no less obstinately contended that it should be baked. This dispute ran from words to blows, for Nell, not choosing to let her province in the household be thus interfered with, jumped up and threw the stool she was sitting on at Sim, who on his part seized a besom and applied it with right good will to the head and shoulders of his spouse. 
Now she seized the broom, and the battle became so warm that it might have had a very serious result had not Nell proposed a compromise that the cake should be boiled first, and afterwards baked. Well, that escalated quickly. Now they did finish the cake, and this new and remarkable production in the art of confectionery became known by the name of the cake of Simnel, or Simnel. So ignoring their marital issues and the gratuitous domestic violence of the story, the cake that is described is the Shrewsbury Simnel cake. It would be first boiled like a Christmas pudding and then wrapped in pastry and baked so it would be crisp and hard on the outside. Then it was traditionally decorated with little crenellations like a castle on top. And while we don't have a real recipe for that, at least that I could find, we do have a wonderful little poem from 1867 that describes how the cake was made. She who would a simnel make, flour and saffron first must shake, candy, spices, eggs must take, chop and pound till arms do ache, then must boil, and then must bake, for a crust too hard to break. When at mid-lent thou dost wake, to thy mother bear thy cake, she will prize it for thy sake. And as Miss Elliot says in the poem, the cake was made for the lady's mother. And at least by the 17th century, the cake had become associated with Mothering Sunday, which has nothing to do with going to visit your mother. It actually meant that you would go to visit your mother church or where you were baptized. Now, it probably wasn't that far to go visit your mothering church in the days when very few people ever left their hometown, at least to live somewhere else. But by the 19th century, people had been traveling and were getting jobs out and about, so going to visit your mother church was also a good excuse to go visit your mother. You never call, you never write, and then one day a year you come visit your mother? You want a medal? Oh, you saint! Oh, you break your mother's heart. By the time that poem and the story of Simon and Nellie were written, the Shrewsbury Simnel cake was actually on its way out. It was to be replaced by the berry simnel cake, the kind that we're making today. And that's because the berry simnel cake was about to go on one heck of a marketing blitz. First in 1845 at the National Anti-Corn Law Bazaar. Sounds like a real hoot. Also, if you didn't watch last week's video on the Irish potato famine, I talk about the corn laws and why people were so anti-corn law. Anyway, the bazaar featured a cake of ponderous proportions. It is a Bury Simnel, and measures, we should think, some five feet in diameter, weighing 280 pounds. And upon its broad surface, a sheet of iced sugar so large as to have inscribed upon it nearly all the maxims which embody the religion of the League, and so sweet and richly ornamented as to almost induce the visitor to swallow them. That was a bit of really well-written shade right there. And in 1863, a much smaller, albeit still 70-pound, berry Simnel cake was given to Queen Victoria. And since then, that was the Simnel cake to have. Now, our cake is not 280 pounds, nor is it even 70 pounds. Probably about 2 pounds, I would think, maybe 3 pounds, but it should be about ready to take out of the oven. So once your cake is baked, set it on a wire rack to cool completely. Then we'll make the almond paste, and it is really easy. Just add the almond flour and your sugar to a bowl and mix together. Then add in your eggs and mix until smooth. Boom, you're done. Now, if you refrigerate it, it is going to be easier to work with, but you don't have to. Take half of the almond paste and roll it out to form a disc. Then set that on top of the cooled cake. And you can crimp the edges or score it for decoration. It's really up to you. Then take the other half and form it into little balls to set on the cake. Now today you would make 11 balls to represent the 12 apostles, minus one, because Judas doesn't get a ball. But that actually wasn't really a thing until quite a bit later, so you can make as many balls as you want. Then you brush the top of the cake with the egg white and sprinkle a little bit of sugar on top. I forgot and didn't remember until about five minutes ago. Luckily it doesn't change the flavor that much, but it will make it so my cake is probably not going to be as wonderfully dark brown as, as your cake will be, because surely you will not make that same mistake. But once you've dusted it with sugar, set it back in the oven for a few minutes. Though honestly, the best way to do it is to put it under the broiler for about two minutes. But watch it carefully or else it will burn. And then it's ready to serve. Here we are, Berry Simnel Cake. Like I said, the amount of fruit in there is just, it's fantastic. And I did get a fair, nice dark browning on the, um, on the almond paste, but it would have been better if I had put the egg wash on. I also decorated it with a little bit of crystallized fruit, but I don't really like crystallized fruit, so I didn't put that much on, and I'm actually just going to knock it off right now. But here we go.
it's good, but it's very sweet and very fruity. Um, and it's kind of dense, you know, denser than, than a typical cake. And that's because they're like five times the amount of fruit to, to the batter. But it's, the flavor is very nice. My favorite part is the almond paste. It's so simple, but mm, I just eat that all day. And this kind of cake goes perfectly with a cup of coffee from Trade Coffee. So make sure to get 50% off of your first bag by clicking the link in the description and using the code TASTINGH50. And I will see you next time on Tasting History.